Amen. All right. You know, I'm, I'm trying to get through Matthew chapter 5, and every time I teach the Sermon on the Mount, it just <laughs> it ends up taking longer and longer because there's so much more there every time I go through it. And it was all there to begin with. I just kind of grow up a little bit and kind of get a little bit more out of it. And, and uh, it's just amazing as I look at it because we, we see again and again through this passage, you've heard it said, but I say. And what he's doing is he's correcting their thought. He's, he's putting them in a right frame of mind, a right place to emulate God properly. And so he's correcting them. And Understand, they had one way of seeing things. It was very legalistic. It was very uh, by the letter of the law. But Jesus says, but I say. And things aren't always as they appear because it may seem very legalistic as Jesus goes through there as he kind of doubles down on some of these issues. And so things aren't always as they seem. You know, the other day I went into the store and I came out and I saw a police officer writing a ticket. I wasn't in a very good mood, and I looked at him and said, why don't you do something useful and go arrest some real criminals? <laughs> so he writes a new ticket <laughs> for my bald tires. And I go, listen, buddy, I want to be nice here, but man, somebody should have slapped your mother the day you were born, buddy. <laughs> Another ticket. I'm sorry, I'm a Christian, but I'm a fallible Christian. And I went on for about 20 minutes. He kept on writing tickets the whole time, which was okay by me because I was parked around the corner. It was a joke. I'd never treat a police officer that way. But things aren't always as they seem. Sometimes we think we have our paradigm down. We, we, we have our walls built, and this is how we're supposed to live. And then some new information comes in, some revelation comes in, and it kind of turns that thought upside down. And Jesus came in, and he ruffled a lot of feathers, for sure. They had a lot of ideas. They had their, their, their walls set up the way they were supposed to live. But the way they were living was legalistic. The way they were living was ritualistic. It was not based upon love. It was not based upon relationship. And he is really trying to bring these people to see it differently. And so he keeps on bringing up these issues. And in chapter 5, starting at verse 38, Jesus says to the disciples, he says, You have heard that it was said. When he says that, he says, you've been taught this. This is what the experts have told you. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, that is biblical. He's quoting from Exodus chapter 21, verse 24. And God is giving out how certain crimes are supposed to be punished. Remember the law of God, the over 600 laws of God, 10 of them are the moral laws of God. Then you have the civil laws, how you're supposed to get along within the, the, the civil community. And then you have the, the laws that, that, that bring the rituals and the pointing to God in them and the, the ceremonial laws, right? And so as you look at this, he says, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And the principle is still valid for us today. It's proper. You know, when people come out and they say, we're, you know, we're, you know, tough on crime. You're not supposed to be tough on crime. You're supposed to be just on crime. Absolutely just. And that's what an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth does. It, 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 it limits you from going too far, right? But they were quoting it much differently. Right, and but but what he's going to do is he's going to go forward and he, and he's going to talk to people about being free to respond differently, not exactly you know eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but he's he's going to go beyond that and he's going to he's going to allow you to to either seek justice or to also give mercy and give grace towards others because God is the great judge, but he's also merciful and graceful. And he's patient as well. Some people say, well, God's not patient. You just read the Old Testament. He judges people all the time. And then let me ask you something. Do you guys know whether King Saul was a good character in the Bible or a bad character in the Bible? 
He was a bad character, wasn't he? He had every opportunity to do well, and he didn't do so well with God, right? You know how God, you know, God allowed him to prosper as a king? You know how long God allowed Saul to rule? 40 years. What? That's a patient God. And I'm sure glad he's patient. And he does show mercy, and he does show grace, and he is long-suffering with us. Why? Well, all of us are sinners. You know, we get to be about two years old. We learn what the word no means, and we, no! You know? God doesn't do that. The wages of sin is death. He doesn't take you out right away. None of us would be here, because all of our ancestors would be dead before they got to the age where they could have us, right? And so he is merciful. And the, the, the thing about studying the Bible is, is we're always trying to figure out, you know, here's the law side of it, and here's the grace side of it. And God is amazing because he is both. And you got to take the Bible as a whole, and some people tend to take it as this harsh rule book, and then some people tend to take it where it's just all license. But, it, but it, there, there is a, a middle ground. But the thing is, you can't find that middle ground unless you have a true and living relationship with Jesus Christ. You just, you just can't figure it out. And it's so funny, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to figure out where that line is, and then someone over here is just judging me harshly, and then someone over here is, oh, you're too harsh, you know? And I'm like, I'm probably in a good spot, <laughs> right? Because I'm trying to live in that relationship with God. And so Jesus ultimately is going to be talking about how we as individuals ought to respond when we as Christians are offended or are challenged to to, to respond in the flesh. And he's not talking about taking personal revenge on others. He doesn't want us to take things personally. He wants us to be able to set them aside and say, God, how do you want me to respond without my personal emotions involved? And he gives us the power to do so. He's, he's challenging us to be truly different in this world, to be salt and light and to represent him well. So again, I'm going to read verse 38, and this time all the way through verse 42. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. And if anyone who wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. And so at this point, the Jewish leaders that Jesus is talking about, those who had taught the disciples to this point, and Jesus is reteaching them, they had twisted the scriptures to their advantage once again. We've seen this as a pattern. And this time it's concerning the, the, the exacting of justice and how we respond to a wrong. You see, they taught the letter of the law that a Jew was perfectly justified in exacting um, law against people if they had been offended. And in their teachings, they would go even further. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And uncaringly and without heart, they would exact judgment on other people because they were living by the law. And many times, proportionally, they would go way beyond the law. And so we need to understand, for us, the Lord tells us, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And when he says that, he's not saying that if something is wrong that you can't correct it, but he's saying, take the personal out of it and seek me on how you need to deal with it. Because sometimes you're going to forgive a wrong. Sometimes that person that is wrong, you needs to learn a lesson, but it can't be a personal vendetta from you. That's not right, it's not good, and we Christians are not to live that way. And so you're not to administer things out of just angst towards a person. You're supposed to step back and say, God, how do you want me to respond? And, and that's a good way, if, if you can get to that point, God, how do you want me to deal with this? But it's a beautiful thing. Because without relationship with the Lord, all we want to do is exact justice all the time, right? When you're on the road, you know, you, you know sometimes you're, you're, you're driving down the road and you want one of those extendo arms with the little um, um, uh, 
boxing glove on it. Shaboom. Shaboom. The problem is I'd be going, dum, dum, you know, because everybody would be doing the same thing back to me. But, but, but this is the nature, what God does by giving us a heart of flesh, a heart that reflects his heart, is he gives us the option to respond differently. Right, And it's a beautiful thing. This isn't just take the slaps. Right, again, and we're talking about relatively small offenses here. Okay? And so he's he's correcting their temporary beliefs with the intent of what the law or the spirit is actually saying. But they were religiously zealous and relationally restricted. You can be religiously zealous, but relationally restricted. People that live this way towards God, 10 minutes in the word of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Five minutes in prayer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? As opposed to, I want to spend time with God today. And as much time or little time, it it isn't on the clock. It's you're having a relationship with God. You know, my wife says, hey, honey, you know, can we get together and pray? Okay, five minutes. I want to talk to you about something. Okay, you got 35 seconds. (laughs) But if if you deal with God this way, you are dealing religiously. And that's what people do. Sit, kneel, stand. That's it. And you go out and you feel completely justified. But God wants us to live in a relationship with him. And if we start treating God this way and just seeing his rules as a bunch of rules that are legalistically by the letter supposed to be held out, and we're not looking for the heart or the spirit of God in it, we treat other people the same way. Good relationship with God, good relationship with others. That's how it works, right? And so these men were lacking in their religion love. And loves close neighbors, grace, mercy, forgiveness, humility, peace, etc. But is the Lord the law? Yes, he is. He is righteous. He is the judge. But he's also grace and mercy. So religion without love can be treacherous and evil and normally is. What does the reality of God's love lived out in men's lives really look like? That's our goal. We want to love and behave like God would have us because he created us in his image. He gave us life. He is our spiritual father. What do the spiritual virtues and gifts look like in a heart that has been turned from stone to flesh? Rules-based, relationship-based. Now in Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19 prophesying about the nation of Israel once they get away from the rules and they step into relationship with God, prophesies this, then I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them and I will take away the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. Is he saying walk in the, law, in the, in the letter of the law or the spirit of the law? Because he's talking about the heart, right? And that they will be my people and I will be their God relationally. But as for those whose hearts follow the desire for their uh, detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord. And so some can be very treacherous, but God's desire for us is that we show grace and love and his heart towards people. So justice may need to be exacted, but it is not to be personal and vengeful. Paul says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. 1 Thessalonians 5.15, see that no one repays another evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all men. 1 Peter 3.9, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. So again, justice may need to be exacted, but it is not to be personal and vengeful. The difference is, is when you're disciplining your children. Sometimes, if you've ever raised children, they might, perchance, every once in a while, possibly frustrate you. 
And the first thought as frustrated humans is we want to smack because we want to, you know, get out anger. Like, you know, you're not going to smack them hard, but, you know, smack, oh, smack their knee, right? My girls, I don't know that I ever really spanked my girls. They were pretty good kids, but they always laugh, and they bring it up still. They're 25 and 27, or 26 and 28, actually. And they go, Dad, remember when we were driving on the way home from church, and we were fighting in the back, and, and, and you were in the front seat, and you're going like this, uh, 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 you know? <laughs> And you were missing us? That was so funny. You know, they just think that's great. But I'm so glad I didn't connect. Because it, I was angry. And it was, a, it was, it was a per, in my flesh, it, I was seeking personal fulfillment. But what happens when you're disciplining properly? When you're disciplining properly, you're going to them and you're saying, you know what? I was upset. Now I'm not upset. Now I'm worried for you. Because if you continue this behavior, it's very bad. And I want you to grow up to be a successful adult. That's my job. And so I do need to exact some justice, and you need to have some punishment. Because if you spare the rod, you hate the child. If you love them, and the key word is you are careful to discipline them. So sometimes judgment does need to be taken out. It's not like, oh, yeah, just forget about it. But you're not doing it in a personal, personally vengeful way. And this is where you stand back in any situation and you ask God, what do you want me to do? I'm, I'm a public figure, or at least I'm up front, and people see me sometimes as an authority figure, and they may have problems with authority, and sometimes people lash out and say horrible things about me or to me. And lo and behold, I don't know how that happens because I'm such a nice guy. No, just kidding. But, um, <laughs> but sometimes that happens. And I can be hurt personally. But what I do, and this is a principle, and I teach pastors, I teach anybody that has any authority in any realm this, do not correct somebody until you know it's the best thing for them. Until you get over your own personal anger and God teaches you the lessons, and then you go to them and you say, it is better that I do this for you. Oh, I can't believe you're so angry. I'm not angry with you. I'm over that. I've dealt with that. Right now, I'm doing this because you, you are going to be a better person if you listen to me right now. You see what I'm saying? Like, rebuke needs to happen. But I'm not going to take it out personally. And so the Lord does correct us, doesn't he? He is a good father. He knows how to met out those corrections in our lives perfectly, doesn't he? And so we do need to be corrected. But I tell you what, there's a lot of times where the Lord covers it over in love as well. He doesn't nail me for every little thing either. And I'm trying to understand how to do that with God. But the blessing is, is we are told we're not just to go out and be evil for evil. Right? Again, that term, tough on crime. No, you're not tough on crime. You're fair or just on crime. Tough on discipline. No, you're just and fair and careful on discipline. You don't want to go too far. Eye for an eye. Not less than an eye. Not more than an eye either. Right, And there's also times when you give up your rights in, in, this, uh, in this give and take, as it were. And so Christians are to seek relationship with God first and others second as a priority, not our personal rights and not our personal revenge. It is usually better if we Christians just allow ourselves to be wrong, especially if another Christian is involved, rather than to strike back ourselves. And what happens is, after this, the Lord or the Holy Spirit might come to you and say, okay, pray and let love cover over that sin. Or it may be a Matthew chapter 18 thing where you're not letting it go and the Holy Spirit's telling you, deal with it, but now you've gotten beyond the personal vengeful attitude back. This is where the Jews of Jesus' day had said, no, you can be vengeful. You can hate your enemies. You can smack them back. You can take them to court. You can do all these things. But that's not what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to back up and do things his way. And many times for us, the witness is in allowing ourselves to give up some of our rights to be angry. Ah, oh, what do you mean? Well, listen, the greatest act in all of history was God giving up his rights to rule, his rights to be right, his rights to punish, his rights to wrath. He has all these rights, and he gave them up in order to allow himself to be hung on a cross in place of our sins. And we are supposed to emulate him. And so for me, 
I'm not addicted to alcohol, but I know that probably half the people statistically in this room have had a problem with alcohol. Oh, Jesus drank wine, that's fine. And if you drink wine with your fish, that's fine. Being drunk is sinful, right? But, but if you, that's fine. Personally, I have given that up because as an authority figure in our culture, the way our culture teaches alcohol, the Lord laid it upon my heart over 30 years ago. Don't drink because you're an authority figure to people and you might cause someone to stumble. That's yours. That's me. That's me personally. Okay? That's not legalistic if the Holy Spirit told me to do that. Right? But I have the right to do something, but I give up that right because I want to be more effective in people's lives. I'm seeking relationship more than my own personal freedom. You won't see me going to an R-rated movie. Now, there's some R-rated movies that are good movies. Some of these, these, these war movies and things like that are good movies. The Passion of Christ was rated R. But you won't see me publicly going to an R-rated movie. Why? Because some people have struggles with movies, and some R-rated movies are very bad to watch. <laughs> but I've just decided. I'm going to give up that freedom in order to build relationship better, and not let these things get in the way. I have every right to do so, but I'm going to set that aside. That's just me personally. You might have other things in your life, right, that, that you give up. There was a, a man in our church, early on in our church, and uh, he, had, uh, he wasn't an alcoholic, um, and he liked to smoke a cigar every once in a while. I don't see where smoking's in the Bible, right, at all, okay? So, but the, the, the thing is, he would have women's Bible study in his house, and he would be out in the garage, pumping weights, smoking a cigar, piddling around, fixing the mower, drinking a beer. You know, and I told, you know, I, I took him out to lunch, and I said, you know what? I don't think you're in sin. I don't think you're a sinner. I don't think you're rebellious. But I do think because of your Epicurean delights, you might limit yourself on how you minister to people, right? So if you want to have stuff in your home and they open the cupboard and you have all this alcohol and stuff, you might stumble some people. And many, most won't be stumbled, but some will be. And, and, and you told me you want to be a leader. I'm just letting you know that. that. That might get in your way. And I let it go. And six months later, he cleared out everything and stopped doing it. And he's a pastor today, okay? And, 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 you know, these are just things that for him and our particular church, that worked best for him. But I never came after him. or That was all him. I just, this is what I'm kind of feeling, and I'm going to share that with you. I want to be willing to give up my rights. I want to become all things to all people so that I might win some. See what I'm saying? I don't want my selfishness to get in the way. And again, my situation is different. You have things in your life and people in your life that are different than people in my life. You, there's there's going to be other things, right? This is me as a leader in the church, a visible leader in the church, okay? Um, so, it's better if we give up the right to revenge. It's better if we give up that right and then we step back and we ask the Lord what you want us to do, Okay? 1 Corinthians 6, one. dare any of you having a matter against his brother go to law before the unrighteous and not before saints? Do you know that the saints will judge the world and if the world will be judged by you, you are unworthy to judge the smallest of matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? If then you having judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint these to those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren, but brother goes to law against his brother and before unbelievers. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? And so, again, this is, this is that idea. I'm seeking relationship with you. Why are, why are we in, in the courthouse downtown? He says that's a shame. Now, sometimes, you know, sometimes it gets to the point where you're going to be in the courtroom. 
but have you tried to work it out in Christian circles first? And it's saying, are you willing to compromise yourself or are you going to get the most? Someone ran you. You're thinking in your mind, I'm going to sue. I'm going to get a new truck. Right? Is that what you're first thinking? You're thinking, oh, I hope they're all right. Right? There's a difference, isn't it? In America, our mindset is, man, you're going to pay. And we've got to get away from that. Now, I'm not talking about insurance companies suing insurance company. I'm not talking about someone else's insur insurance paying for your sickness because they hit you or your injuries because they hit you. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about some things that are small matters that become big things. You guys ever watch Judge Judy? How many of those people should not be in that room? Most of them, right? It says stupid. Like just pettiness. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians get involved in this pettiness and they're not willing to work it out and they're not willing to back off. You guys need to understand, as pastor of this church, we, we, you know, sometimes pastors come in and they say, you know, this is my vision and you guys all got to stick in this box. You know, and, and, and the pastor makes every decision or this, this group or whatever. You know, for me, I'm like, I'd rather, have, I'd rather have purple paisley carpet than lose a relationship with you. Now, no one please suggest purple paisley carpet. <laughs> we'll make you pay for it, you know, because <laughs> we're not going. But anyways, but you know what I mean. Like, like, but churches split over the color of the carpet. And, and that's how petty things can be. And we can be so non-compromising and unloving and no grace. See what I'm saying? And, and, and this is where it gets. And then they end up in, and there's been churches in this town that have ended up in the court of law. Assistant pastor versus pastor. Should that have ever gotten to that place? Mm -mm. Not if they're living out what the scripture says. And they get to that place because they're living out and they think they're completely justified by the scriptures and they're trying to live out the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. And the spirit of the law is love God and love others. And they get to the letter of the law and they start suing each other in public courts. Now again... Most of these are smaller things that shouldn't get there. Sometimes things have to be handled by the courts. I'm not saying that. But these particular things, I, I think you guys understand. We, we get to this place of ridiculousness. But Jesus is our example, right? He's God in the flesh. They spat in his face. They beat him. They struck him with the palms of their hands. How come he just didn't let go of all the, 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 the carbon bonding going on in their molecules and just go... You know, there goes Pilate, there goes the Sanhedrin, you know, they're just gone. Dust. He could have done that. He's creator and sustainer of all things. But what did he do? Because of love, because of reaching more people, because of relationship, he allowed himself to be beaten, spat upon, his beard ripped out, his back opened by a cat of nine tails. And at the end he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He's saying, I have the right. You guys are sinners. The wages of sin is death. I have the right to take you out, but because I want a relationship with you, I'm going to set this aside right here. And that's what he did. And, and, and what do we do? We want to, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I deserve this. Peter stated this, for what credit it is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. If you're willing to lay aside, for, for, for the Spirit of God, you're willing to lay aside your rights. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. And when he suffered, did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. When he said, forgive them, for they know not what they do, that is such a freeing statement. And here's the thing. It unleashes you from other people's issues. They sin against you, they got an issue. And when you forgive them, you've now removed yourself from their issues. You're free. You don't have to hold on to it, be angry, looking for ways to get back. You guys ever spend time trying to figure out how you're going to get back at somebody? Anybody here? Anybody didn't raise your hand, you're lying. 
Oh, it runs through your head, right? Oh, the ways to get back at people, right? What a waste of time. What a sinful waste of time we are, right? And I'm not just talking, I'm talking to me, right? That, that it, it was just such a waste of time to do this. And the Lord's saying, you have an option. And even if you go forward with judgment, the judgment is for a different reason. It isn't a personal vendetta. It's to teach them a lesson. You guys remember in the situation we had in our church where a woman was sent to prison for seven years unfairly. Eventually, she was completely exonerated. Now, by law, the state had to give her a settlement, a few hundred thousand dollars. Now, understand this. A woman was falsely accused of something and sent to jail for seven and a half years, just like this woman was. And it was just her and her husband for seven and a half years. She got over $20 million when she sued the government. This time, a husband and five kids were involved. Could have been $30 million. What did they do? They prayed about it. And literally, the prayer was this. Lord, it isn't about the money. It's about whether you want us to help reform the system or not. See what a different attitude that is? Because I know had they gotten that $30 million, they would have given it, most of it away. That's how they live, right? That's who they are. But it would have been, God, do you want us to do this for your glory, not for our personal vendetta? And they didn't, they didn't go that way. They were free to go, nope, that's over. We're just going to move forward. And they did. And this is where we do our prison outreach out of. 10,000 women in our state are being reached this Christmas through our prison outreach that started in this church through that tragedy. But see, see where the option is? It isn't, it isn't this personal vendetta. And so he gives them very practical life things that they're going to deal with as Jews. Understand, it isn't the letter of the law. It isn't all about exacting this and exacting that and being angry at people. I'm going to give you the spirit of the law. And four examples he gives here. A slap in the face. Now, for the Jews, a slap in the face was a great offense. Now, we're not talking about self-defense here. Okay, we're not talking about protecting your family or whatever. All that is biblical, and that's fine. Protect, you know, you can have self-defense. That isn't against this. This is a small offense of a slap in the face. But what do we do? Ooh, ooh. you know, now you're messing. Sometimes we do it right. Sometimes we don't do it so right. I'll tell you one time I did it right. <laughs> I won't tell you about all the wrong times. So... I'm, I'm a water person, right? I always say I'm a penguin. When I do triathlons, I'm in the lead after the swim. I hold my own on the bike, and I run like a penguin, not only swim like a penguin, right? <laughs> wah, 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 you know? <laughs> so they all pass me up on the run, and I feel horrible about myself by the end of the race. But anyway, so I'm just kind of going backwards the whole time. But I, I grew up on swim team. I played water polo for eight years. Um, I, I was a lifeguard. I trained lifeguards, and I've surfed my whole life. Right? I used to be able to hold my breath for three minutes. When I'm out surfing, you know, if I'm out in the water and there's bigger guys around me, I'm fine because I will drown you. you know, or I'll hold my breath. I'll hold you underwater as long as I can or whatever. You know, if you're trying to hurt me, I can defend myself in the water. On the land, I can run pretty fast you know, or as far as short distances. I'm still a penguin, but you know, <laughs> it's better for me if I just jump in the water and say, come get me, you know, because I'm not a fighter. But in the water, playing water polo and all this stuff, I'm... I'm I'm, I'm a water person, and when I go surfing, I tend to catch a lot of waves, and some of you in this room know this. I have a watch that records how many waves I catch. I didn't get it until like a year ago, and it's so funny. I'll show people my, my, my surfing sessions. Normally, time people will, will catch like six waves in an hour. I'll catch 15 to 20 in an hour, and, and, and on my, my Apple Watch, I'll, I'll be graphic, yeah, like, oh, I went 500 feet on this way, blah, blah, you know, and it's like, I catch a lot of waves. I've always been that way. So one day I was out surfing this place that they nicknamed Cars when I used to live down there in San Clemente because it's a spot that I always surfed. I grew up surfing there. I knew everybody out in the water by face, knew nobody's name, but everybody by face. I surfed there every day when I lived uh, down in San Clemente. And uh, so one day I'm out there. It's a pretty beautiful day, a summer day, a south swells coming in, the water's warm, and there's a hundred guys out in the water. That's a lot. But guess who's catching a lot of waves? And if you're not catching a lot of waves and someone else is catching a lot of waves, you get a little frustrated. 
So this big dude paddles up to me, sits on his board, and just clocks me. <laughs> it sounds pretty bad. But when you're in the water and you try to swing at somebody, it doesn't work very well. <laughs> you know, it's just like, eh, okay, whatever. You know, it's, it's nothing. And uh, it was funny because I remember, and I, I don't know if you guys ever do this, but sometimes in your Christian life, you step out of, out of your side, outside of yourself, and you look at your response, and you go, well, that was weird. And this was one of those moments. Because I looked at him, and instead of anger, I just, I just thought in my, in my head, like, are you okay? And I asked him, are you okay? And it was funny, because he's this big guy, and he's looking at me like, like, I thought we were going to have a fight here. You know, and I'm looking at him, and I'm just going, are you, no, really, are you okay? And, and, and I'm, I was concerned for him, because it's this beautiful day. A good day of surfing is better than anything. Right? It's like, it's so good. Are you okay? Now, now, the weird thing is, everybody in the water knows me, and, and everybody starts getting on his case and threatening to beat him up. I didn't do that. I'm just a poor guy. He had to get out of the water because everybody vibed him after that. But my heart was, are you okay? And I thought, God, you have to be real. <laughs> you know, if there's any evidence for God, that is it right there, right, when you respond well in that circumstance. But other than that, the only other response in the flesh I had was to get upset, start yelling, blah, blah, you know, or whatever, you know, or tackle the guy and start doing water polo stuff on him, you know. Um, but that's the difference. That's the option we have, guys. He punched me for no reason. I didn't do anything to him. I had every right to get upset, yell, get mad, whatever, sick my friends on him, whatever. But the Lord did something different. Small offense, right? Not a big one. And I didn't have to get angry. A slap in the face. But guys, how quickly are we ready not to turn the other cheek and throw the fist or throw the attitude or throw the anger? Or an, un an unfair lawsuit. An unfair lawsuit. And, and again, we, we covered this already, but if it's going to come between me and you, take it. Just take it. Because relationship matters more than stuff. So often people come to the church and they always apologize to the staff. Oh, sorry for taking your time. And I always tell our staff, listen, these are people. They're eternal. They matter so much more than our stuff. Take the time and talk to the people. The, the tasks will get done eventually. Take your time. The people matter more. But they're always, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, um, it's... It's just, you, you, people matter more than your stuff. And so in, in situations like that, but again, you know, it's not, like, it's not like you're just giving away your stuff because people are unfairly or unjustly, you know, ripping you off. That's different. But if it comes to a place where they can't pay, they, they can't pay you back or, they, or, or they're, they're pushing something and you're like, you know what, this isn't worth it. Here you go. What are they going to do? They're going to be humbled, aren't they? They're going to step back and they're going to go, there's something different about you. What is it? And that's what you're looking for, right? You want to be salt and light in this world? Be different. Don't be like the world is. How about being compelled to serve unfairly? In those days, the Roman soldiers had the right to tell a Jewish citizen, here's my pack, carry it for me one mile. And, and, and here's what Jesus is saying. You want to be a witness to me? Someone tells you to carry the pack, and you have the availability and the opportunity to do so? You know what? Pick it up. And go, hey, bro, yeah, all right, pretty heavy pack. And then you go a mile, and the guy's going, man, I wish this person would shut up. Give me a pack. No, I'll carry it another mile. <laughs> what kind of witness is that when someone goes above and beyond? You ever have your neighbor mow your lawn for you? It's sweet, isn't it? It's different. You ever mow your neighbor's lawn? And they're kind of shocked. They don't know what to do with it. Like, really? But these are good things. And this is what he's saying. But the Jews were all about protecting themselves by the letter of the law. They had these rights. And he's saying, give up your rights for the sake of the gospel. Give up your rights to emulate my character. What about being asked for money? Now, after service, a bunch of people are going to ask you for money. <laughs> no, just kidding. But 
the thing is, what he's saying is, when someone asks you for money, it's really for those that are poor and are really are in a situation. It isn't just trying to extort money out of other people. And you're actually giving them what they need. If there is a poor man among your brethren with any, or any of the gates in your land which the Lord your God has given you, if there's people in your community and you know them and you know their situation and you know they hit hard times and it's a real need, you can meet that need and it's okay. You don't have to push back and you should be generous towards them without expecting them to repay. Listen, our church doesn't give loans. You know why? Because that loan might get in the way of relationship with your church. And we don't want that to happen. So we give benevolence to people when they need it, when something comes up. And when they get benevolence, they say, oh, well, I want to pay it back. And we always say, it's between you and God. We're not keeping a record of it. Why? We don't want this to come in between our relationship. And the key is, when you're loaning at a personal level, and it's not your mortgage business or whatever, when you're loaning at a personal level, you should not loan to someone unless you're willing to give that up for the sake of the relationship. Don't do it. And I've seen people do this with cars and various other things, and it causes a schism in the relationship. Do not loan to someone on a personal level unless you're willing to give it away for the sake of the relationship. And just say, really, no no big deal. Really, we're friends, we're good. Let's go out to dinner. I'll buy. You know, whatever. You you need to be willing to get to that point. So it needs to be a a true need. And generosity is a blessing, and it shows God's heart. God paid for your sins with the blood of Jesus Christ. Is he a generous God? Absolutely. You know, one of the things I love about getting older as a pastor, I, I kind of realized that I, I judge our church differently than when I was an ambitious young man. As an ambitious young man, it was always numbers. But now God has taught me, no, look at what I look at. Look at character. A friend of mine recently who took over a mega church with tens of thousands of people in it weekly, and now it's in the hundreds. He said, you know, the church I pastor used to be much larger before I took it over. But he said this, it is such a beautiful place to be now. The character of our church has grown so much in the last few years. And that's a beautiful thing. I know last week, Fab did mention that, that, you know, Kate was sick and people started giving. And what a blessing. There's hotel rooms still. Their family's in hotel rooms up there. There's there's a, a large deductible and things going on, and there's going to incur other things. And you know what? I, I was in California, and, and I get a text from Fab. Yeah, this is happening, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm like, of course it is. Because that's the character of what God has been doing in your guys' hearts for years. You know, we, we are a good church to suffer in. I don't want everybody to suffer in our church, but because the heart of God comes out in this church, and, and, and what a blessing it is. To be, to be willing to say, I'm going to give you this money. I may never get paid back, but it's okay. And if I get paid back, fine. That shows responsibility. But it doesn't mean you can just go and take advantage of people. So don't hit me up for money right after service. <laughs> but the key phrase in the second verse here is hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. Luke chapter 6. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. When you turn the other cheek, you're being a peacemaker. When you forego the lawsuit and give up some of your rights, you're a peacemaker. When you go the extra mile, you're a peacemaker. And when you give to your brother in need without expecting anything in return, you are a peacemaker. And you know what? Blessed are the peacemakers. And it sounds counterintuitive, doesn't it? But so many Christians live grumpy and miserable lives because they're not really willing to test God on what he says. But he says, blessed are you when you live this way. And I tell you what, man, I'm I'm a man. You know, I'm very generous with my hobbies. I'm very stingy otherwise. Any, any men relate in this room? All the women are going, my, my husband, right? 
But I prayed a few years ago to be generous, and God gave me the opportunity to learn to be a little bit more generous. My wife is still way more generous than I am, right? But, but he's, he's teaching me. Again, don't hit me up for money afterwards. I'll know what you're doing. <laughs> you want to have a good lunch. You know? But anyways, um, but that idea of generosity, being a peacemaker, being like the Lord who didn't hold back. Peter builds off of Jesus' teaching and applies it to relationships between brothers and sisters in Christ. He, um, he says in 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Hearted, be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. So Jesus says, but I say to you, I'm giving you something different, a different way to live. Is it impossible to live this way? No. Is it hard for our flesh to live this way? Yes. And therefore, you need to feed the Spirit and practice these virtues in your life for you to be able to live them out. Again, Jesus lived this out for our, to be our example. At his arrest, when Judas comes to him and he betrays him with a kiss, he doesn't say, you dirty, filthy jerk. He didn't say that. You know what he says? Friend, why have you come? Friend, why have you come? What does Peter do? Cuts off a guy's ear. What does the Lord do? Heals the guy's ear. Hmm. Again, back to the trial we went through um, with Hannah. I was able to give a four-page letter from, from Hannah, who had gone to prison unfairly for seven and a half years. We had talked about it. And one of the prosecutors, I ended up counseling through a divorce. She was sitting in my office, and I looked at her, and I said, you said some really bad things about me and our church in court. And she got all nervous, <laughs> you know. And then I said, you need to know, I believe what I teach. And I've already forgiven you, but you need to know you're forgiven. And I go, but that's not all. And I got up and I handed her this letter from Hannah. And I walked out of the room. And I came back, and that was a four-page letter from Hannah forgiving one of her prosecutors in this handwritten letter. And I came back, and it was beautiful. It was just a pool of tears. And she was just amazed that forgiveness was real. Hannah had the right to be angry. She was lied about. She was slandered and maligned, and, and all kinds of sinful things took place during that trial. Illegal things took place during that trial. And she forgave. Because God gave her that option. Without the Lord filling your life, you don't have those options. You're going to respond in the flesh. And instead of this being a, oh man, now i got to do it this way. No, you get to do it this way. You see how different that is? I don't have to walk around in anger and bitterness and unforgiveness and vengeful wrath and thinking about how I'm going to get back at everybody who's ever wronged me. I am free to move on with my life. Praise God. And the amazing thing is, when I do that, I'm going to affect some people around me, and they're going to look and they're going to see there's something different about this person. They're not responding in the way that I would expect them to. So when Jesus was at the crucifixion, what did he say? Or what did they do? Well, they sold his tunic, and he looks down. And finally at the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Again, they didn't deserve that forgiveness, but he gave it. How to be salt and light in this world, how to be different, how to make a difference how to be blessed. I tell you not to restrict an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. 
If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. And give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Marching orders for this Christmas season. Uh Uh-oh, family. (laughs) Crowds at the store. People driving crazy on the freeway. God has given you an option. Make sure that your spirit is full, read up, prayed up, and ready to go so that you can actually take that option. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, we thank you um, that we can live differently, Lord, and that we can respond differently. We would just pray more and more for the power to do so, God. Lord, I pray for those in this room that are bound up by bitterness, anger, frustration, unforgiveness, holding wrongs against another, Lord, and I just pray that you would lead them to be able to remove it from the personal hurt stage, that if they need to deal with it, they deal with it your way, not their own. Lord, I just pray that there would be a lifting and a freedom even right now in this room from those burdens, those angsts, those grievances, Lord. That we may be led by your spirit on how to respond and how to do things in this world. That we would be different, that we would be salt, that we would be light, and that we would be blessed, that we would be free, that we would be different, that people would take note and we would do this all for your glory. And we love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.